introduce myself. I'm um, a Great War or a war um, researcher. My main focus is First World War, but I'm dipping my toes in Second World War. One of the projects which I have ongoing is to do with the houses that were built after the Great War for ex-servicemen across Northern Ireland. Um, the Irish Sailors and Soldiers Land Trust, whose insignia you can see on the screen, built 1,252 what they called cottages, but in a lot of them, we would probably more um, rationally describe them as being houses. So there's just over 12, 1,250 houses built in Northern Ireland for ex-servicemen. The ISSLT built 290 cottages in East Belfast and Castlereagh between the two world wars. After the Second World War, the Trust built a further 64 houses in the Knock area, and the Hague Memorial Homes Charity built 20 houses at Mount Marion Avenue. In tonight's talk, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the houses built in the two colonies in the, the Craiga area, um, Earl Hague up at the top, and the Craiga colony down at the bottom of the image on your screen. I will be referring to the houses built after the Second World War, but that will be more in passing because the amount of information, the amount of documentation available in the public domain is extremely limited for those. Um, the ISSLT houses built at the two colonies in the Craiga area were designed by Roland Ingleby Smith, who was the chief architect for the Department of Works and Public Buildings in the Northern Ireland Parliament. He also designed the mausoleum for Sir James Craig, which is at, uh, at Stormont next to Parliament buildings. The houses in this area, and in fact, the ISSLT houses across the province were built to a very solid construction and to a very high degree of, um, what's the right word, a very high degree of uh, quality. Sorry, I'm stumbling a bit. Um, they were all finished with a rough cast exterior, which was painted white, with the exception of the houses in Jellicoe Avenue in North Belfast, which were a red brick construction. Um, all the houses were painted white and periodically um, the ISSLT would visit the areas and would repaint the houses. In a lot of areas, the houses are still white, but in some places, people have decided to, um, to paint the outside of the house in different colors. But generally, when you go around the, the houses in the province, you can t they're nearly always white. And even within the, uh, the Craig economy, they, there's still a preponderance of white houses, which I hope we'll see later on. Okay. Um, this is, uh, Lisa was talking about last week's talk and how um, it was all green fields. And the start of our talk is something similar in that the area which I've marked in red there was, the, uh, was a 17 acre plot that was bought in the Ballymacconachie townland from the Marquis of um, Downshire for 2,084 pounds and a few shillings. And that equates to 120,000 686 uh, pounds in today's terms, or approximately 7,000 pounds per acre. Now, if you were to try and buy an acre of land in this area now, you'd be talking of 100,000 plus. So they, they got it at a, quite a value. And I think quite often the, the, the people who sold the land, who were quite often wealthy landowners, they saw it as a way of giving back something to the, the ex-servicemen community. So in essence, there was an element of it being a type of war memorial activity on their part. So this is where the Craiga colony was built. As you can see, with the exception of the houses on the Craiga road itself, totally surrounded by, um, by fields. The, rail, or the uh, tramway terminus was nearby more or less where the bus terminus is now. In April 1922, Castlereagh Rural District Council rejected a proposal for the erection of 34 houses on this site. And it did so for the following reasons. First of all, um, there was no provision for efficient um, drainage from the sullery sinks. The proposed widths of the streets did not comply with the council's bylaws, being only 15 feet rather than the required 36 feet. 
The plots were too large as gardens, but not large enough for profitable cropping. And the present practice in other public housing schemes was to have a density of at least 10 houses per acre, whereas the proposal would have had would have been for two houses per acre. Now, in a lot of the rural areas where the ISSLT built cottages, it was quite common for the cottage to be on a plot of land that was round about um, half an acre. Sometimes um, they were even up to a full acre. So, but because this was in an urban area or in what was um, proposed to be um, a lot of urban development, they wanted to have um, less or more, more houses per acre than the ISSLT was proposing. So the ISSLT then put in a, a separate submission for 146 houses, and this was accepted by the council in October 1923. There was to be this was to be the largest ISSLT colony in Northern Ireland, and on average each house occupied a 0.12 acre plot. So even though it was 10, um, 10 houses per acre was the projection, they were still getting away with having slightly more than that. And as you can see the, from looking at the map, the houses in the colony had larger gardens than the, the large terraced and large semi-detached houses on the front of the Craigor Road. This was partially to enable um, the men to grow their own crops and so forth. There was also uh, an open area here where I'm marking it with the cursor, and that was set aside for um, allotments. But we'll come back to that later because there's something additional has been built there, which has necessitated the removal of two of the cottages just where my cursor is at the minute. The houses in this area were completed between July and December 1925. And based on the Belfast Street directories, all the houses were occupied by the end of 1927. Bear in mind that when, a, when you look at the 1926 Belfast Street directory, the information contained in it would have been collated in 1925. So 1927 reflects the people who had moved into the, the houses in 1926 or possibly very late 1925. The initial rent for the, the houses in this colony was 10 shillings per week, and that equates to 30 pounds per week in current terms. Now, as we go through and I talk about each of the types of houses, the styles of houses and the number of rooms they had and the facilities they had, you'll quickly come to see that 30 pounds per week, you would, you would not be able to get rent a house for 30 pounds a week containing these facilities, if you could even rent any house for 30 pounds a week in in today's market. The houses, as I said, were built close to the tram terminus on the very edge of Belfast with fields on three sides. It became known as the Craiga Colony and it had its own shop and its allotments. The occupants formed their own orange lodge, the Craiga Defenders LOL 1588, and a branch of the British Legion was formed mainly by the men from the colony. The Legion Hall was built at Bells Lane, which is what this thoroughfare was called then now it's now Montgomery Road and the um the Legion Hall would have been round about here where my where my cursor is now it doesn't appear in any of the old maps because it would have been built in the late 20s or very early 1930s in 1929 a war memorial was built was constructed erected in the colony to commemorate the fatalities in the Great War from the whole of what would have been regarded as Craiga. So it would have been sort of right the way down to the, the, um, uh, to the Woodstock Road and out over where the, the dual carriageway now is. Alexander Robert Hogg had been engaged to produce a photographic record of the development. And what I'm gonna show you now are some of the images from the files held at Prony. In this photograph, um, you can see if I didn't have that other photograph superimposed, there's railway tracks there which would have brought the, the goods and the goods and the bricks and so forth onto the site. The houses in the foreground are at the junction. So these houses, these two houses, this set of semi-detached houses here, they're at the junction of Bapalm 
Picardy and the full avenues. The war memorial, for those of you familiar with the layout, would be approximately here. What I've put on to this also is the Google Street View image of the same location now. Um, the angle's not quite right, and the semi-detached house over here has now been extended um, drastically to one side. Um, but you can still see the, the layout is very similar, the style of the house, certainly the, the, the house here is very similar to what it was, same here. And you can see that although these two houses are still painted white, and so are these um, two, this house here has been painted a, a stone color. But it gives you a flavor for how little has changed. This photograph with the, um, the obligatory young urchins in it was taken from Bell's Lane, Bell's Lane and it's looking along um, Picardy Avenue. Um, you can see the road curving round at the top of the picture, and that's where it curves around to meet up with the Phil Avenue. So this would have been taken in 1925. As you can see, it was taken on the 25th of August, 1925. The houses are substantially built. Um, the urchins, not sure whether where they came from, possibly um, Alexander Hogg brought them in just to have some, some um, people in the image because there wouldn't have been many urchins, right? if, I, if that's not an offensive term, um, living in that area at the time. This is possibly one of my favorite photographs of the um, from the Hogg collection. Again, it's August 1925, and you can see the um, the steam engine, steam traction engine, which was being used to break up stones to be used as gravel for the roadways. And I think that this photograph is taken at Somme Drive. So Somme Drive runs along here, and Thiepfel Avenue runs along here. But it's very difficult because when you look at the layout of the, the scheme, it was um, quite the same sorts of uh, layouts appear at different places. And this is another photograph, again, taken from um, Somme Drive looking down the Phil Avenue. And this is a photograph that came comes from the ISSLT's report of 1924-1926, which contained a lot of images of the houses that had been built both in Northern Ireland and in the Irish Free State. Um, so this would have been taken shortly after the houses were built, possibly even after people had moved in, because you can see curtains, the windows in one of the houses is, is open. This is a plan, um, again, from the, the Pro New Records, showing the layout of the colony. And it also defines for each block what type of house they were. In the, uh, the Craig colony, there were three types of um, ISSLT cottage. There was 28 type W1 semi-detached cottages, 38 type W2 semi-detached cottages, and 80 type W3 houses that came in blocks of four. So these are some of the W3s up here and along here. And you can see the way they've been more or less interspersed, semi-detached block of four, semi-detached block of four, and that sort of works its way around the colony. Some people say that, um, I've, or I've seen it um, um, on social media, Facebook and so forth, people saying that when you look at the colony from above, it's the shape of a Union Jack, which when you look at that, it isn't. Although when you look at this corner here or this junction here, that does look like the shape of a Union Jack with the St. George's Cross and then the St. Patrick's Saltire. So this is a, um, very useful because it shows before any of the, the gardens or any other building was being done, just what it looked like or what it planned to be looked like. And again, you get a sense of the amount of space that each, um, the amount of land that each house had compared to the houses adjacent to it. So 
So I'm going to talk through each of the um, different house types in quite in some detail. This is um, the type of W W1 house. I should say that all the houses in this colony um, all had three fireplaces, one in the living room and two in the two main bedrooms. The scullery in each cottage also has what is marked on the plans as a copper. Given the proximity of the bathrooms to the copper, I can only assume this was um, a hot water tank. If you think of your immersion tank, if you still have an immersion tank in your house, it's a copper tank. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to look at each house in turn. So this is the type W1 semi-detached cottage. It was 20 feet wide and 22 feet deep. The windows had metal frames and bars holding the small panels in place were also metal. There were 54 small panes of glass at the front and 48 at the back with 102 square panes of glass altogether, which would have meant um, washing the windows was a bit of a nightmare, I would have imagined. So looking at the ground floor, on entering the house um, via the front door, there was a small lobby that gave on to the stairs leading up to the first floor and also gave access to the living room. The living room was 13 feet by 14 feet, two inches, which makes it 184 square feet. A 24 foot, um, 24 square foot uh, larder was accessed off the living room and there was built in shelving. A second door from the living room ran into the scullery or what we would now call the kitchen. When you access from the back door, you came into another lobby and on one side you had a water closet room and on the other side you had the access to the scullery kitchen and a third door led into a coal or fuel storage area. In time, a lot of the, the tenants, a lot of the occupants would have got an outdoors coal bunker installed or built and then this would have been used for additional um, storage space within the house. The scullery kitchen had an area of 54 square feet, um, but was only six feet and 11 inches wide at its widest point. So you can imagine six foot 11 inches, it doesn't give an awful lot of room to, to maneuver. Um, so they were quite small, but then they were scullery kitchens. They weren't what we would regard as a kitchen today. And then at the other side of the scullery, off the scullery kitchen, was a bathroom, um, which was 27 square feet, being four feet, seven inches at its widest point. And you can see what I mean there about the, the copper being adjacent to the bathroom. So I'd imagine it was there to, to heat up hot water for the sink and for the bathroom. On the first floor, there were three bedrooms. The largest bedroom was 15 feet and six inches by nine feet and nine inches, giving it a, an area of 151 square feet. And it had a small built-in cupboard, which would have been over the, the stairs coming up from the ground floor. The second bedroom was 10 feet and two inches by nine feet and six inches, 96 square feet. And the smallest bedroom was nine foot six inches by six foot 11 inches, an area of 62 square feet. Um, what we would now refer to as a box room, you'd have just about managed to get a bed into that room um, without much additional space around it. So that's the type W1 cottage. The type W2 cottage was very similar in design. And one of the design features was at each end were these large raised chimneys um, from which the fireplaces um, fed in and also obviously a chimney at the middle of the house. But a lot of the houses have dispensed with these large chimneys because fires have gone out of fashion, went out of fashion, fireplaces were bricked up. There's no need for a chimney. And so you'll see in some of the houses, the, the chimneys have been removed. The type W2 cottage was 21 feet wide and 21 feet deep. As with the W1, the windows had metal frames and metal bars separating the glass panels. There were 36 small panels of glass at the front and 72 at the back, 
108 square panels, square panes of glass in all. But it would have meant that the houses would have been very, would have felt very light and airy, airy, especially when you consider that a lot of the, the folk that moved into these houses in the 1920s would have come from small terraced houses in inner East Belfast or other um, parts of the industrialized parts of Belfast, where the windows would have been small and there wouldn't have been that many windows in a house. So now you're suddenly they're moving into a house where not only does it have three bedrooms, a bathroom and a water closet room, but you're also getting a lot of light coming into the, the rooms. On entering the layout for the type two is slightly different as you can see um, with the scullery and so forth down one side of the house rather than at the back of the house. So when you come in through the front door again, there was a, a lobby and that gave access to the stairs and into the living room. The living room was 14 feet and seven inches by 12 feet and 11 inches or 204 square feet. A 24 square foot larder that extended under the stairs was accessed from the living room. And of course, there was a doorway from the living room into the scullery kitchen. When you entered the house um, from the back door, again, you came into um, a lobby with the, um, the water closet room off to one side. Um, when you came into the scullery kitchen, you had the coal house on your right hand side. The scullery kitchen was six foot seven inches wide. And the scullery kitchen had an area of 49 square feet, but again, it was long and narrow. At the opposite end of the house from the back door was a bathroom with a, um, an area of 21 square feet. So again, by modern standards, these houses might be considered to be pokey, but by the standards of the time, they were quite, um, quite, uh, quite large facilities, especially when you compare it to what the families had come from from before. The first floor again, there were three bedrooms. Largest bedrooms was 15 feet and 11 inches by nine feet and eight inches, 151 square feet. And again, it had a built in cupboard um, over the, the top of the stairs. The second bedroom was roughly 10 square feet, having an area of 96 square feet. So it's roughly 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, the smallest bedroom was nine foot six inches by um, nine foot by six foot and seven inches, an area of 62 square feet. You can see there's one of the fireplaces in the bedroom and there's the fireplace in the main bedroom. So those are the two semi-detached houses on this estate or in this colony, um, the semi-detached. The other ones were the blocks of four, which were the type W3 cottage. And again, you can see that the design is broadly similar in terms of the layout um, and the, um, the windows and the, the window panes and so forth. The W3 cottages were built in blocks of four and each dwelling was 20 feet wide by 22 feet deep. The type W3 had the same number of windows as the type W1, and the layout of the rooms was the same. The room dimensions, however, were slightly different for the center houses and for the, the houses at the outside of the block. The side access, um, the, the end houses also had side access to the, the back gardens, whereas the center ones, everything had to be moved through the house. And that uh, side access was particularly valuable where the occupant was, was wanting to operate a small workshop on the premises or to use the, um, the plot as a market garden to grow food and veg for, for sale. The ground floor, the living room of both centre and external houses were 13 feet deep. Um, room width in the centre house was 14 inch, 14 feet, 11 inches whereas it was 14 feet and two inches in the outer house. So the outer houses had maybe slightly smaller rooms, but they had the benefit of the, the side access. 
Again, you've got the scullery, you've got the water closet, you've got a cold shed, and you've got the bathroom. On the first floor, the main bedroom in both houses was nine feet and nine inches deep. Um, the width in the center house was 16 feet one inch um, compared to 15, six, 15 feet six inches in an outside house. In the same way, the back bedroom in the center house was five inches wider than an outside house. So again, broadly similar, not much difference. Again, you can see the, um, the fireplaces here and here, and there would be the corresponding fireplace on the ground floor in the living room. So those, that's a quick run through the, the three different styles of houses in the Craiga colony, which is the term I use. Other people use the term Somme colony, but in the official documentation, it refers to it as the ex-servicemen's houses at Craiga. Further down the, uh, further down the Craiga road was another colony. And I refer to this as the Earl Haig colony because all the street names are Earl Haig Gardens, Earl Haig Park, and so forth, Earl Haig, Earl Haig Parade. The ISS LT purchased a seven acre parcel of land from Alice Ray of Derrimore Tower. So Alice Ray lived here. Um, her husband originally had a brickworks, Ray Brickworks, which was on this site here. And then part of their, one assumes that they, they owned the land all the way up to um, Oberon Street and Glendower Street and so forth. Part of it had been turned over to allotments until late 1920s when the ISS LT bought seven acres of the ground, which I've marked in red. Um, the purchase price for the seven acres was £3,407, 13 shillings and five pence. And that equates to £211,616 in current terms. Um, for those of you not familiar with this area, there, used, there was a jam factory here, which is now a bakery, I think, or certainly in later maps was a bakery. But you can see this massive area of land here. And as you'll see in a few minutes, it's now totally built up. This is the next um, map, which shows the Earl Haig colony after it had been completed. 72 Type T semi-detached cottages were built here by August 1931, and the initial rent was eight shillings per week, approximately 25 pounds um, per week in current terms. Um, a further 72 of these Type II houses were built at three locations in, in East Belfast, Clara Avenue in Bloomfield, Brandon Parade in Sydenham, and Enid Parade in Ballyhackamore. And this is the same area now where you can see all that open land, the allotments have, have all gone. It's probably even worse. This is a, a map from probably the mid 1960s. So by now uh, where you've got depot and so forth there, they're probably all gone. This is the type T cottage. Um, was built in four house blocks in some locations but all the cottages in this area are semi-detached type T's. And the same goes for those other three areas that I mentioned. The type T cottage was 17 feet and six inches wide and 21 feet and 10 inches deep. As with the type W cottages, there were three fireplaces in the house, but there was also a skylight on the first floor landing giving a bit of additional light. On entering through the front door, stairs leading to the, um, the first floor, faced the door and there was a door leading into the living room, which was 13 feet, six inches wide and 12 feet deep, 162 square feet. On entering through the back door, there was a lobby. So again, you've got a lobby and there were two doors leading off the lobby. One took you into the water closet room and the other took you into the scullery, which was eight feet, six inches by eight feet wide. So more of a square kitchen than in the type W houses, um, which would have meant, given it, made it feel a bit larger as well. Um, there was a cold storage area, but in these houses, the cold storage area was accessed off the kitchen rather than off the living room in the type W 
houses. So you can see that um, because these were a later design, they were taking into account some of the difficulties perhaps that had been experienced with the type W houses and just tweaking them a bit to, to make it more rational. Because you don't, if you're bringing coal into a house to store it, you don't want to br be bringing it through the living room. You want to be bringing it, if anything, through um, the kitchen. And as I said before, over time, a lot of the houses then had their own external um, cold storage areas, and this would have become more storage space in the in the house itself. Um, so the the scullery was sixty eight square feet. And there was a door into the cold storage area and also then into the bathroom. And you can see now the bathroom, which has a, a built in linen cupboard, is more of a rectangular shape rather than the L shape that was in the other houses. And also the bathroom is now closer to the water closet, which meant that from the point of view of drainage and so forth, it was um, it was simpler. On the first floor, again, there were three bedrooms. The main bedroom was the full width of the house and it was eight feet and 10 inches deep, 145 square feet. Um, there was a built-in cupboard and the window jutted out. So you can see here, here um, the window is jutting out from the main part of the room. This meant that there would have been space here for a dresser or cupboards or um, storage, but it also meant that it, it gave this the the um, the room just a wee bit more space, and it also is a design feature that makes the Type T cottage identifiable no matter where it's built. Second bedroom was eleven feet and four inches by eight feet and um, seven inches, ninety five square feet, and the third bedroom was roughly eight feet by eight feet or sixty six square feet, and now you can see um, the skylight is marked on the plans. So that's the, um, the type T cottage. So if I just go back, um, you can see here on this image, the, um, the, uh, the bit that juts out from the, 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 the front of the bedroom. I don't know what the correct term for that is, possibly alcove, but there you go. Um, I mentioned there was a development by the ISSLT after the Second World War. And that was at Thornhill Parade um, off Barnett's Road in the Knock area. 62 houses were built. And the sense of colony was retained by building most of the houses around a central green. So you've got two roads coming into the colony, if we can use that term, one from Barnett's Road and one from Thornhill Park. And then you've got this massive, relatively large, area of green in the middle, which was common land. It was for the for all the occupants. It wasn't divided up into gardens. But again, you can see from from this um, aerial view that the gardens of the houses were still considerably larger than the gardens of the semi detached and sometimes detached houses in the adjacent um, air, adjacent streets, Cabin Hill Gardens and Cabin Hill Park which would be more affluent. In some respects, it's unusual that you've got this development for ex-servicemen um, being placed in the middle of what would be um, a desirable residential area, mainly middle class. And um, I wonder whether there were any objections at the time about building houses for ex-servicemen who would be mainly laborers or manual workers and would maybe be bringing the price of the house. The, the good old NIMBY um, concept was probably around then as well. The houses in this area, there were six sets of terraces with eight houses, one um, six house terrace and four and two four house terraces. So all the, all the houses here were built in terraces of four, six or eight houses within a terrace. So that's one view looking down the green area um, to a set of eight houses at the end there. This is a side view of one of the blocks of eight houses. And this is a, a close up of 
two of the houses in the middle of a, a block of, of six. So again, you can see they're very different from the earlier houses. They're, um, to my mind, they're, they're not as desirable. I think they were wanting to build more in a smaller area. And so you're ending up with houses that, that don't have many features to them. They are just sort of Lego houses. I can use that insulting term. In 1951, the um, Hague Memorial Homes Charity, which was established in memory of um, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, they built 20 red brick houses on Mount Marion Avenue. 16 of the houses were designated as British Legion um, Hague homes. Two were set aside for men who had served with the Royal Artillery and two for men who had served with the Royal Engineers. And if you're down that way, a Royal Artillery plaque is still attached to the middle four block house. So you've got in this area, you've got a block of four, semi-detached, semi-detached, block of four, semi-detached, semi-detached, and block of four. That's the Royal Artillery um, plaque, which is on one of the houses in the middle block of four. And Two of the other semi-detached houses have a Hague's home, the gift of the British Legion plaque attached to them. You can just see the plaque there in the image of the semi-detached house um, where the mouse pointer is now. Each house had um, five, five rooms plus a kitchen and a bathroom and all had wide doors to facilitate the passage of wheelchairs. In addition, a flat path with no steps led from the roadway to the front door. Now, building houses with wide doors for wheelchair access is something we tend to think of as being a fairly modern or recent um, development. But here we have houses being designed specifically to meet the needs of people with mobility issues. And that's because all these houses were designated for um, disabled war veterans or for war widows with small families, young families. The rent here was not to exceed 10 shillings per week, but would be dependent on the ability to pay. So if a family was enduring hardship, there was the scope for the, the rent to be reduced or to be um, offset until they managed to get themselves back on their feet. Compared to this to the policy at the ISSLT houses, where if someone fell behind with their rent significantly, the ISSLT would take measures to evict, evict them. The criteria for the artillery houses at this site specified that applicants had to be 60% disabled. And the, the army, the, uh, the war office had a sliding scale where if you had lost, say, a leg, you would be 100% disabled. But you have, if you had gunshot wounds that um, meant you had difficulty using your left hand, that might be set at 10%. And they had this sliding scale of different types of disabilities. And it was the de degree to which the disability um, affected their earning potential. So obviously uh, a condition or um, wounds that meant it was more difficult for a man to get a job would have meant that it would have been a higher percentage. As part of the 1951 Festival of Britain, the Ministry of Health and local government held a housing competition and the houses at Mount Marion Avenue won the award for best privately built scheme. I'm going to finish off the presentation by conducting a digital dand around the Craiga colony. So I'm going to um, close the PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to open up um, Google Maps. And I'm going to take you, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Craiga colony, I'm going to take you on a tour around the colony. And I better get back to where I'm supposed to be. So give me a minute. So we're going to start off at Somme Drive. 
And as I go through, I'm just going to, to point out some of the houses or um, show some of the houses. So you can see a, a four block type W3, nice white on the other side of the road. You've got a bit of white and a bit of color. Um, 20 houses were built in Somme Drive. The 1926 Belfast Street Directory, which I said was would have been compiled in 1925, recorded only one occupant. And that was the occupant at number 18, which is the type W1 house. So where my cursor is now is um, number 18. And as you can see, it's been extended to one side, almost dub probably doubling the width. This was occupied by William Major Harvey, a tramway um, inspector who had served with the Royal Army Service Corps. So I'm just going to do a quick turnaround. So there we've got another. And on the corner of Somme Drive and Thiepval Avenue, this is Thiepval Avenue running down here. On this corner, we have a new build house, which has been constructed in by using up parts of the gardens of the two houses, one of the houses on this side and the house behind it. So you find that um, in most of the housing developments where ISSLT houses were built, there has been Ill in building where um, once somebody has bought the house from the ISSLT, they were then at a certain stage were allowed to sell off the land which means that you get houses being built in the back gardens of some of the houses, particularly in rural areas. But that house stands out because it looks nothing like any of the houses around it. It's totally a totally different design. It's more of a just a, a block house with very few sort of features to it. So we're coming up to the junction of um, Thiepval Avenue and Hamel Drive. This worked better when I was testing it earlier on today. So we've got Albert Drive running down here and Thiepval Avenue running up here. I picked this one because this part here is an original house. You can see the tall chimney. The adjacent part of the semi-detached property has been extended so that it's almost three times as wide as it was originally. They've kept the roof line the same, but you can just see here the old roof line, and then it would have come down here. So you can see how big they've extended that. It's quite possible that is a separate house altogether. It's hard to tell from looking at the, the street view. But that could have been built as a as a new house with a separate entrance. There were thirty two cottages built on Thiepval Avenue, which is the longest in the um, the colony, and has the most houses. Number twenty eight has been extended to at least double its original width, but number twenty six externally from the front is unchanged. The early occupant of number 26, Thiepval Avenue, was Henry Lavery Adams, who at that stage was employed as a clerk, and he had served with the um, 1st Battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers. Albert Drive, which is one of the cross um, streets, had um, 20 houses built, sorry, 18 houses built on it. And if we come up to the first one, so we've got a block of four. So again, you can see here that the end one has been extended a wee bit. And the early occupant of number nine, Albert Drive, was John Henry Hutchinson, who was employed at that stage as a hall porter. And he had served with the 5th Brigade headquarters of the Royal Horse Artillery. And when he um, left the army, he held the rank of Battery Quartermaster Sergeant. So he would have been looking after a hall, whether it be a church hall, orange hall, Masonic hall, I don't know. A couple of the houses on the other side. So you can see here that um, this end house here has been pebble dashed, which means that it stands out from the other houses in the block. 
and to my mind doesn't really add to the attraction of it again this house here you can see there's been a large extension to one side and the new doorway has been built in the porch a porch has been built out from the front as well And you can see in, in this block of four for the end house, a porch has been built onto the front. So the next junction on Thiepville Avenue is Hamill Drive. And for those of you who haven't made the, the connection already, um, all the street names in this colony are named after battles in which the Ulster Division participated. Some people have used that to make the assumption that it was the all the houses were allocated to men from the Ulster Division. That is not true. There were 18 cottages built on Hamill Drive, but two of the cottages have been knocked down to make way for the access, the entrance to Hamill Court. Hamill Court is a modern, um, it's built on the old allotments and it's single story and it provides accommodation, shelter accommodation, still for, for veterans and ex-service personnel. So the Milliburn Trust, which took over from the ISSLT, is still carrying out, in essence, the same, same work. It's going to come out of Hamill Drive and go down the other wing of Hamill Drive. And it moves into another street. There's no boundary, there's no down line. But this house here is the end house of Hamill Drive. And then these houses are, I think it's Downshire or something like that. No, um, Stirling Street, Stirling Gardens. So I'm just going to back up a bit to Hamill Drive. House one, two, three, four. And then there's another building, another house has been added on to the block of four. But when you look at it, it's kept the same sort of outline of the of the, um, the the roof. So it doesn't look out of place. It's and even the size and shape and positioning of the windows makes it look as if it's part of the original block. As you can see, all the small panes of glass have been removed with double glazing coming in. Number 20, this house here. Um, the, an early occupant of that was Angus McGugan, who worked for the British Legion and he had served with the Royal Naval Reserve in the First World War. Moving back along and back onto Thiepville Avenue again. So you can see white houses still painted. And at the junction of Thiepville Avenue and um, Picardy Avenue and Bapalm Avenue, we have the Craig of War Memorial. Celtic Cross that was erected and it was unveiled and dedicated on the 10th of November 1929. If you're wondering why didn't they just wait a day and have it on Remembrance Day, that's because the, the main cenotaph in Belfast was being unveiled on and dedicated on the 11th of November 1929. Behind the memorial are two cottages. And again, you can see that one of the cottages is virtually unchanged and the other cottage has been extended to the side and is virtually double the size. The original um, occupant of this cottage, which was number 26 Picardy Avenue, was Adam Hamilton, who was a labourer who had served with the 14th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. When Peter McCabe and I were up um, doing a recce for a tour that I was running, we met this man here. And that's Reggie, Reggie um, Hamilton. He's the son of the original owner. So that house, and Reggie only moved out of this house within the last couple of years, I think. So that means that this house here, has been occupied by two people since it was built in 1925, and now be three, but it stayed passed down from father to son. So moving down Picardy Avenue, again, you've got a mixture of the four block houses 
and the whoops gone too far and the two block houses. At the end of Piccadilly Avenue, we swing round onto what's now Montgomery Road and originally would have been um, Bell's Lane. You can tell when Google Earth went or Google Street View went along this road, it must have been round about, I would say, May or June of some year because the lads are out collecting the pallets for the bony. There were four houses built on Bell's Lane, as it was called then. Block of floor, four. And if I just zoom in, you can see that this house has been called Rue de, Char Rue de Sarge. And I'm wondering whether at one stage, all four of these houses were occupied by men who had held the rank of sergeant. Don't know because I haven't been able to research those men. And swinging round into the Palm Avenue. Again, you can see um, one of the houses has been painted a particularly nasty looking shade of olive. And the last house we're going to look at is these two semi, these, this semi detached block. And as you can see, it's virtually unchanged externally. Still got the large chimneys, um, the windows layout, and so forth. The first occupant of number 14, Bapalm Avenue, was Leslie Hammond, who had served with the Royal Navy. In the 1927 Belfast Street Directory, Leslie was recorded as being a motor driver. So whether that meant he, he drove a van um, or whether he was possibly a chauffeur for somebody, it's not particularly clear. So that brings this evening's presentation to an end. I've used this um, end piece as a bit of an introduction to next week's talk which will be looking at how I went about identifying the occupants and their backstories. So if you're available next, next um, March the 3rd, I think it is, um, we'll be looking at some of the houses, but also looking more importantly at the occupants. And I'm gonna talk through how I went about identifying um, who the people were and then trying to build their backstory to show you how the information can be gathered. So, question time. Thank you so much, Nigel. That was amazing. Uh, really comprehensive. And it feels like we were almost there, which is as good as we can get in COVID times, isn't it? To feel like we're almost there. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, sorry, you... just, sorry, Lisa, just before you um, go ahead, Emily Lee. Emily. Yes. Lee. Where's Emily? Oh, hi, Emily. Um, yeah, the tour, Reggie came out of his house. I, I'd prearranged with him to do it um, if he was around. And he brought out his father's medals. And they were in the original box. He didn't have them in a presentation case on the wall. He had the original box that his, the medals had come in. And it was just fantastic. I think Emily agree. It was fantastic to be able to handle his medals and to hear his stories about living and growing up in that area. Wouldn't you agree, Emily? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was it was such an interesting tour anyway. But whenever Reggie came out with his medals and he talked to us for ages, he was such <laughs> a lovely man. It really made our day. Yeah, I think I think that that's why I kept whenever I did that tour. That tour was of war mm -hmm. memorials in East Belfast. And again, it was part of the East Side Festival um, a few back in 2018, I think it was. Um it was looking at the various war memorials in and around East Belfast, but, and we were finishing up obviously at the Craiga War Memorial, but to, to be able to speak to somebody whose father had participated in that war, and although he must have been a, a, a right age, he was still cogent and he had all his faculties. I don't know whether he has passed on or whether he's had to move into a, um, a sheltered accommodation, um, but, I know he was a character, and whenever Peter and I were, were doing our recce for that tour, um, we were told by one of the residents, now if you start talking to Reggie, <laughs> you've got to be prepared to be here for a while. Because as you say, he could talk the hind legs off a donkey. Mm. <laughs> it was a highlight, it was really good. Good, well, that's nice to hear. Um, any other questions, comments? 
Well, there's Jillian's put a comment into the chat there, Nigel, that it was very interesting. And we almost got a glimpse of her childhood home in Sterling Gardens and walked through this area many times. Oh, right. Yeah, Jillian, so did you know anybody who lived in, in those houses? I can't remember, Grandma. Did you visit somebody in Albert Drive, was it? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, I visited a lady in Somme Drive. Um, it was part of our, uh, I went to St. Finian, so we visited, the young people visited the elderly people, like on a weekly basis. So I was in that house. I always loved those houses. Um, a girl from school, whose surname was Adams, um, and you mentioned Adams as one of the owners. So um, they lived in one of the houses as well, but I always thought they looked like English country houses. I, I always thought they had a beautiful design. And yeah. it, it is a pity that people have changed the look of quite a few of them. I think it detracts from the original I think, uh, concept. I think it would have been nice if it had been kept as a conservation area yes, where there were yes. restrictions. And OK, internally is a different matter, but some of them, I mean, some of the houses I've seen when I've been going around the province, um, the, the, they've built hideous carbuncles to quote Prince Charles on the sides of them. Yes. And it, it just totally destroys the whole character. As you say, these houses, although, although they, they were called cottages, but I would say they're houses. But I think part of the design of them was to make them quaint. And I think yes. part of that was because these men had gone through so much in the war, they wanted the this, the men who came home and were allocated these houses to feel comfortable and to feel, I don't know, safe or whatever. And I think that this idea, and if you look at, um, I've been going through a lot of this stuff, but um, in County Antrim, they had a scheme, a gar market garden scheme or a garden scheme. And there was a special section for the ex-servicemen houses and some of the newspapers in the 30s ran photographs and you've got climbing roses all over them, which just adds to this idea of it being a quaint Wiltshire yes. country cottage. And I think that was, and even some of the, the designs, when you look at them, you think, well, why does that bit stick out? And it was because they wanted to make them different from all the other houses that were around them. Yes. And I mean, I think that I've been in a couple of them um, up in Larne and um, Kilroot, and they were solidly built. You know, they weren't mm -hmm. they weren't just yes. thrown together. They were really solidly built. And the people that I've spoken to who live in them, one of the guys was saying, internally there was brick walls between each room, as opposed to lathe and plaster. Yes. And he was saying whenever he was um, taking out the walls to make one room out of the dining room or the back room and the front room, they turned one of the bedrooms into a um, a dining room and then wanted to have one large room. He said it took forever for him to, to knock the wall down. It was so, and this is a hundred years later or 80 yes. years later, whatever it was. So there were, there were, there were lovely, lovely properties. And it was lovely that they had such big gardens because I yeah. remember as a child, that's the way we walked through to go to Daddy Winker's Lane. And I always enjoyed looking into the people's gardens. And some of them had garden gnomes and things, but they were always beautifully kept. And it was always quite an adventure for me to be walking that way through to the, the park to play. So yeah. I, I think have fond memories of it. One of, the, one of the ideas was that if men couldn't get jobs because of their, their war service, they wanted them to have a means of income and that's where yes. um or maybe not so much a means of income but being able to grow their own food mm. or certainly their own um, um fruit and vegetables i know of one um case which i was looking at uh, uh, down in rich hill and the man was running a market garden and then the isslt which still owned the land decided to sell off part of his garden to a developer and he was irate. He says, I've already lost my blueberries. And if this carries on, I'll soon lose my raspberries as well. And it was, just reading his letter was, it was, you know, but he had, he had had the, the wit to think, well, 
it's too large to be just a garden. So I may as well make use of it. I can grow fruit and veg. I can then sell it in the local local market. And yes. that way he was able to supplement his income. Or if he was unable to work, it would have been his primary income. So there's a couple more chats coming in. Yeah. So Jeanette has actually asked a question that I was busting to ask, except I was a bit scundered that I didn't know the answer already. So I'm really glad that she did. Um, so where does the term working kitchen come from? Was this different set up to a scullery kitchen? I'm not sure if you'll know the answer to this, Nigel. Maybe this is one we can throw out to everybody. Um, I think you'd, you'd probably need to ask uh, that woman that supports Norwich City to get an answer for that. Peter would know who that, what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know. Scullery kitchen. My, my mother-in-law would talk about a scullery kitchen. But her um, kitchen, Lower Seventy Thatched House in North Belfast, it would have been narrow. People also sometimes refer to them as being galley kitchens because they were very similar to the galleys on a ship in terms of layout and space. Um, I, don't, I don't know where these terms come from. And sometimes you'll find somebody in, in one part will say, oh, I'm just going into the scullery. And you think, what's a scullery? It's not a term we <laughs> use nowadays. But even it's um, not at all. my, my, grand, my um, uncle and aunt who lived in a farm in County Monon, they had two living rooms, the good room and the, the ordinary room. Then they had a kitchen, which was where they lived. And then they had a scullery behind the kitchen. And to me, coming from a, a totally different background, it was, what? what What's the difference between a, a kitchen's where you cook food and a scurry? Well, but my, for them, the kitchen yeah. was where you lived and the scurry was my where you did, um, did the working, a working kitchen a lot. Like, so that we, we would have come from like a lot of two up, two downs in inner East Belfast. And she would have always said, go and put that cup in the working kitchen. But it's just the kitchen. We, I was never really sure why she put working in front of it. Um, um, I met, don't know, but I, I would say that's the same as the scullery kitchen. Right. Um, um, Julie has a brilliant connection. Julie, are you still here? Yes. Julie, do you want me to read it out or would you like to chat about it? You unmute yeah. yourself. <laughs> so there so we go. I was so good at muting and I couldn't unmute. Yes, I, I was, uh, well, I was I was born in the Royal, but my sister was born in 18 uh, Home Avenue, which was at one of my grandparents. And then when my my mum got married, my dad moved in with the grandparents. So we grew up um, there. And my grandfather served in the First World War. So Your, grand, had, your grandmother served in the First World War? No, well, my grandmother served in because she was a, a nurse of some sort during the right. First World War. But no, my grandfather was in France with the... Right. Well, he had served with the King's Royal Irish Hussars in India first and then um, went to France. Yeah. Later on. So, so we have very happy memories of the wonderful community that that was. I suppose because my mom had lived there all her life. She knew everybody in all those ex-service men's houses. And uh, it was a, a terrific community. Um, my, our family always say that my grandfather was largely responsible for the fundraising for the war memorial. I don't know whether that's true or not. Well, I haven't seen any details of, of who did the funding, um, but I think it's interesting that they, they chose to put it in that colony because before they put the war memorial there, that's where the men would come out of an evening time to sit around and chat. Yes, yes. Because the one thing about you keep hearing about the First World War is the men who were in France, Flanders, Gallipoli, Mesopotamia, wherever, they didn't talk about their experiences in the home. Well, what they would do is they would meet up with their mates who had been through similar situations. And that's where they reminisced. That's where they let off steam to a certain extent where they were able to, because, um, you know, in 1920s, it wasn't the done thing for a man to show his emotions, certainly not in front of the women. But in front of his mates, it would be OK. And I think that's why they, they erected the war memorial there. Also because it was a natural position of the meeting of the three roads. But um, as to who did the fundraising, 
Um, to what extent was the British Legion involved? Because obviously the, most of the men living in, in that colony would have been Legion members. Yes. And then you've also got, you've got this, this, this fact of community. They had their own shop. Um, it was self-contained. Um, they all knew each other. Um, and because they were sort of sitting on the edge of the city, some people might say, well, you know, why did they put them out there so far away from the workplace? Because a lot of these guys would have worked in places like Mackey's and Sirocco Works and the shipyards. So why did they put them away out there? But I think it was also to give them a better style or standard of living. So it's, it's difficult to know how some of those things came around. Um, Gillian um, has just had some internet problems there and um, ha has temporarily left us, but um, she had wondered something that I was wondering too. It's like I always wondered why they were named after areas where the men had had a traumatic experience during the war. And would yeah. this have not been a daily reminder of the horrors of the war? Yeah, so um, that, that's, what, that's what strikes me as well. But you do find it coming up time and time again. Um, so Earl Haig was named after, obviously, the, the field marshal. So that's a slightly different scenario. In White Abbey, you have two colonies named um, Cambrai and Ypres. In Glen Gormley, you have a colony named um, St. Quentin. So again, they were named after battles. I don't know whether these names were chosen by the occupants or whether they were imposed by the ISSLT. Um, but I don't think, I think it, it, it was part of engendering that, that sense of community where they felt that this was something personal to them. And whether they, whether they um, it brought back traumatic memories, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll never know unless we're, unless we're speaking. I mean, for example, I think it was, was um, Julie was mentioning um, Davy McCulloch. I mean, um, do you ever remember him saying that he didn't agree, he didn't like the names of the streets? Oh, I don't remember him saying that at all, no. And he did talk about the war, not in the way that um, he didn't tell us anything dreadful that had happened, but it obviously was a huge part of his life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure they were all proud of what they had done as well. Uh, so there, there was that aspect of it. Yeah, so I, I don't know, I mean, but it does seem strange. I do know that um, a man called McClinton, um, three brothers all went off to war, one died, two came home. And at one stage he named his house, which was off Wandsworth Road. It was called St. Quentin, I think. It was certainly named after a battle. But when you're looking at the Belfast Street directories, it was called St. Quentin up to, say, 1925. And then in 1926, he had changed the name. So did he change the name because it had just gone 10 years after the events and he fancied a change? Or was it something more personal where it started to bring back memories? We'll never know. And that's the, that's the tragedy of not, people not having documented these things at the time. Um, Jacqueline says, um, the design was probably influenced by the Garden City movement in England. I'm not, I'm not, I know that there was Garden Cities um, houses built out at White House as well, but I'm not sure whether they were post First World War or post Second World War. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that, but I do know that um, Ingleby Smith, as far as I'm aware, he was an Englishman. So coming over, he's probably bringing over some ideas that he had from the other, the other side of the, the lock there. Right. Um, 1900 kitchen was what we now refer to as the living room. Scurley was off the kitchen and had a sink. The, um, Peter has chipped in with Delia Smith, let's be having you. Delia Smith is the um, cook and she's the chairperson of Norwich Football Club. Scully, Scully was where you did all the dirty work peeling spots and heating water in the copper on wash day. Kitchen was where the fire was for cooking, eating, 
Um, all right. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Dennison Mahood saying he visited Mr. Harvey's home in Psalm Drive many times as he was a good friend of Brian, the son. Hey, nice to have a wee bit of a personal input. Yep. Um, what am I? Trench is named after streets back home. I know that certainly um, there was a lot of that because you even, you even get some um, situations where they applied names to towns and they used names that they were familiar with. But yes, there were things like um, Londonderry Avenue and, and Shankill or whatever. Right, um, I think that's all the, gone through all the, the questions on the, the chat. If anyone has any more questions. As soon as we're now at nearly 10 to nine. Did I oh, go on for too long? Yeah, how, how did they allocate the houses to the ex-servicemen? So my grandparents bought a house in Mount Marion Avenue. So Grandpa fought in the Somme and they bought a house in Mount Marion Avenue after the First World War when they got married, but how did they allocate those houses Are you to gonna have people? To, you're going to have to tune in next week for that. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's no, actually, actually uh, because there might be some people here that won't be here next week, um, the allocation process was quite bureaucratic. There was a form that had to be filled out, and the form had to be signed by two men of good, two men note, two men yeah. of good standing. In other words, a minister, an employer, um, the bank manager, someone like that. So they had to get references. Um, there was a, a points system. So whenever they filled out the application form, the application form asked them when they enlisted and when they were discharged. It asked them what their rank was. It asked them whether they were married and whether they had any children. It asked them whether they'd received any gallantry awards. Um, it asked them whether they were in receipt of a pension, an army or navy pension. And that was important because if a guy had a pension, then that meant that he had a guaranteed source of income. So even if he was out of work, he had a guaranteed source of income that would enable him to pay the rent or hopefully pay the rent. Um, also, what they also took into account was whether the man had been wounded or suffered any um, ill effects. So with the First World War and the gassing, you get a lot of men who came home who subsequently suffered from the likes of emphysema, um, bronchitis, and were more prone to respiratory illnesses like pneumonia and influenza. So they also asked them what type, what their current living standards were. So if you've got a man who's been gassed, maybe has a bit of bronchitis and he's living in a damp um, house, then he would get more points for that. Um, and then the, the, there was an inspector went out to talk to the applicants and to, um, to look at their current situation in terms of family and in terms of limit, living accommodation. And then they would allocate points on that basis. So for example, if a man got a Distinguished Conduct Medal, he would maybe get two points. But if he got the Military Medal, he would get one point. If he was a man with a wife and five children, he would get a certain number of points. But a man with a wife and one child would get less points. Um, so it was, it was quite complicated. Um, but they do, from what I've been able to read, they do seem to have tried to cover all the bases to make sure that the men who were moving into these cottages were men who were more deserving of them. I mean, this, you, you've probably all heard of, uh, I was going to say Winston Churchill, but not, it was Lloyd George talking about building a land fit for heroes to live in. Now, when you can consider that probably 100,000 plus men came back to what became Northern Ireland after the First World War, they only built 1,252 houses. So there's no way that was um, covering all the need. And indeed, whenever you move into the 1960s, and I know I'm going a bit off the point, Hazel, whenever you move into the 1960s and they opened up the facility for the widows 
of the man who had been allocated the cottage to buy the cottage, there were still men in the 1960s who were on the waiting list, nearing retirement or possibly in retirement, but they were, they were hoping to see out their days in a low rent, solid accommodation. And they were quite annoyed that suddenly these houses were being sold to the widows of, of ex-servicemen. So basically they had this um, point system, um, what we would now term, um, what is it? Uh, what is it they talk about when you apply for benefits? It's just gone out of my head, it doesn't matter. Um, but they would have looked at a number of factors and decided, right, every man that applied for a house would get a, a rating. And then obviously the men with the highest ratings would be offered the houses first. I don't know whether men have to apply for houses in specific areas or whether, say, a man from North Belfast could put in an application and get a house in Craiga or whether the houses in Craiga were for people from generally East Belfast. And by East Belfast, I mean anything east of the River Lagan. It's, it's too difficult to tell. And a lot of the papers are not available. I've got access to a lot of the papers, but it's, it's more to do with the houses and, for example, I've got access to the 1932 rent revaluation, which tells me who all the occupants were in all of the houses across Northern Ireland, apart from the ones which were vacant, which was a, a very small number. So the information just isn't there, or at least I haven't found it yet. Thank you. Really interesting. Love the talk. Yes. Oh, no, no. Super. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, Nigel, absolutely brilliant talk. We've seen a few other um, comments coming in there from um, from Emily and um, and and others as well. Just saying that it like really enjoyed what you had to say, and now we're really looking forward to next week as yeah, well. So I, get the follow on stories. You know, uh, I suppose I better start looking at next week. Oh, that's loads of, loads of time. Yeah, loads of time. What I intend to do next week is to at least for nothing. Um, yes. Um, it, I think it will be really good. And oh, is Peter turning his camera on? Are we gonna like? Or are you sitting oh, in the dark? Don't turn it yeah, off. There it is. Oh, it's, oh, you're sitting in the car. Are, are, you, are you here? To, are you here to tell us something, or are you just Hi, interrupting? Jana. Hi. He's sitting Hello. in his car so he can pick up somebody's internet free. <laughs> Isn't he? No, he's on my internet and he's on my phone, so. <laughs> And an aircraft here. I know you're, you're dazzling people. Not <laughs> in the usual um, way. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I think because we've a, a few a few new people here tonight, um, we have been chatting in between sessions on Slack. And so Slack is a great way of just kind of chatting to each other. It's a little app you can put on your computer, your iPad, your iPhone, your regular phone. Um, so what if you have? What well, if you're an Android your person? One of your phones, you have <laughs> we don't um, need some um, Apple, you know. <laughs> and um, so we can, yeah, we can chat um, on that in between. If anything that you've discovered or remembered, and um, you know, like read other people's memories of the area, it's just a way of keeping the the conversation going. And um, so if you're not already on Slack and you would like to be, uh, just drop me an email. Um, I, my email is lisacurry at eastsidepartnership.com. I think most of you should have got it in the invite to tonight's session. So um, just if not, just give me a shout, whatever way you can get a hold of me. And I will add you to that. And have a great week. And I will see you soon. Next week. Thank you. Week, folks. Thank you. Thanks right. very much, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Bye bye. 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 bye.